Well, it's uh, one o'clock here, folks. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us on round two of the Kernza Cafe chats here. Um, really glad to see everybody um, online here today, and hopefully uh, we can get a good discussion going here uh, for the next hour or so. Just as a heads up, uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Santa Nestor from University of Minnesota Forever Green. Uh, we are recording these presentations as well. So uh, we're gonna be uploading uh, the one from last week, which is kind of more of an introduction to Kernza uh, and uh, update on breeding from Lita Han at the Land Institute and Colin Curitan, colleague from Forever Green. Um, and then Prabin, uh, who's the perennial grains breeder. So look out for that. I will email this crew um, when that becomes available for sharing. Um, so I already introduced uh, both of us. Uh, certainly as things go along here, um, as you're thinking through questions you have for any of us, please feel free to get in touch. Give me a call, send an email, <clears throat> excuse me. And likewise for Sienna, if we can be of any assistance to you. Um, so here's kind of the schedule of what's, uh, happened and what's coming up here. So the, the order of the day today is to talk through kerns of planting and management. We're going to kind of break out, you know, some frequently asked questions about kerns that have come up, um, from kind of my first year in the, in the kerns space, um, from grower. So, uh, if you have other ideas of topics we should focus on speakers, you'd like to hear, um, you know, we kind of hope that this will roll out a groundwork of some summer field days as well. Uh, so we'll definitely be reaching out to you folks with that. Uh, and we're really pleased to have uh, Dr. Jake Youngers from University of Minnesota talking through the specifics on kerning, kerns of planting and management. If you're not familiar with Jake, he's done a ton of research on this crop and has, I think, a lot of good information for everybody here. Um, so, uh, who's the series for it's for Kernza growers and interested growers in the upper Midwest. And we think of that as, you know, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, South Dakota, and North Dakota. Um, we certainly welcome everybody, um, as a part of these, uh, talks here and would, you know, welcome you to share these talks with anybody you think might be interested. Um, but just would respectfully ask if you're not currently growing Kernza or if you're not a farmer, just to keep the airwaves as clear as possible, just so we can have um, some communication um, from farmers so they can get questions answered, et cetera. And if you're comfortable uh, and you're, you know, uh, Zoom, if you like using Zoom, feel free to type in in the chat about where you're coming from, uh, what part of the Midwest, how many acres of Kernza you currently grow, um, or if you're interested in Kernza, you know, you can type that as well. <clears throat> but yeah, it, it, anything else beyond that, if we can be of any assistance to you, we want this to be um, as responsive to, to your all needs as possible. So please let us know. Um, so with that, I will hand things over to Jake to get things started. And uh, just as a one final housekeeping item, uh, this session is slated to go uh, for an hour. Uh, certainly, if there's more discussion, we can we can keep the line open uh, for a little bit longer than that. Um, but otherwise, I'll hand things over to Jake. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'll share my screen. Look OK on your end? Yep, it looks good. Yeah, it's good. Thanks. Excellent. Great. OK. Um, so we are going to talk a little bit about Kernza establishment and fertility management today. There's a lot to cover on both topics, and we'll just see how far we get. But before we dive into the details about what we're actually going to cover, I just want to set the stage of, so that everyone has the same understanding of the general life cycle of a Kernza production system. Um, so in this region <clears throat> that Matt highlighted, we are really um, used to planting in the fall, sowing seeds, you know, late summer, early fall. And that's generally when we, when I discuss and show information, um, you can assume that most of the data comes from fall seeded plantings, but I will touch on spring seeding a little bit. Um, but generally we plant in the fall, we get some vegetative regrowth throughout that September, October timeline. And then uh, we get our winter cover throughout that first year. Spring regrowth starts right away, usually you know, mid to late March. And it's all vegetative until mid-May. And then um, we have anthesis, 
uh, around 4th of July. And then seeds are ready to harvest by late July, early August. We typically remove all the straw and then the cycle continues with fall regrowth again. Um, so just so that we're all on the same page with that timeline. <laughs> um, we are gonna start with a section on establishment and see these are some of the major questions and topics we're gonna cover. Uh, what are the best crops to follow? What's, what's up with variety selection? What's available, where do I get it? Uh, how about site selection? Timing of seeding, depth, seedbed prep, till versus no-till, rates, spacing, row spacing. Um, how do you know if it was successful? Assess, assessing establishment success. And then we'll talk a little bit about spring planting and companion crop. So that could take some reasonable amount of time, but I'm going to stop after that section and we'll open it up for questions just about establishment. And then uh, there are two other sections that I definitely want to cover. So incentives and financial support. Um, talk about some new developments that equip CSP programs, how to enroll. And then there will be, if time permits, uh, a section on fertility management. So review of Kernza um, biomass allocation. We got to remember all, all the nitrogen that goes into those roots and how to manage that. How much nitrogen is in the plant? How much is removed? Uh, when is the, the, the timing of nitrogen most important? Can we encourage the recycling of nitrogen in this perennial? Uh, and I don't think we'll probably get to phosphorus, but um, it's on the list. So we'll just jump right into things to make sure we have plenty of time here. Um, in terms of establishment, one of the first questions you might ask is how is this going to fit into a rotation? Uh, since we are usually thinking about planting in the fall, late summer, uh, late August, early September, um, and we'll, we'll just talk more about why that's important, that timeline, um, we need to consider some crops that can come off uh, prior to that timing. So small grains are a great option or a pretty good option. Um, there are some issues. We've got to make sure we manage volunteers. So um, really, you'd want to choose a small grain that is spring planted and does not overwinter, like spring wheat or oats. Winter rye could be a challenge because uh, of volunteers. So um, make sure that those volunteers can be terminated um, otherwise, they're going to be competing with your young Kernza seedlings. And annual crops grow a little bit more vigorously than perennial crops. So they're going to be better competitors if they're out in the field competing. And you really don't want that competition carrying over into the next spring. Uh, following uh, legumes is a great idea. Old alfalfa stand or a legume forage or some other forage legume is a great idea. Um, there's just a lot of nitrogen in there that can benefit the current during that establishment phase, um, reducing nitrogen needs in the future. Some other options, if the timing can work out for you, corn for silage, uh, sweet corn and field peas. Field peas, another option, some benefits with the nitrogen uh, fixation by the peas, but not as much as the forage legumes. Um, so here's actually a picture of a uh, field of Kernza is planted in that field, but what you see is mostly volunteer wheat emerging. So this can be a very scary site. And, and uh, I'll be showing a lot of pictures in this presentation. Pictures are worth a thousand words, right? So um, we want to experience or avoid this. Um, and then in terms of site selection, other aspects to consider soil type. Um, you really want to avoid areas that can hold water for a substantial amount of time, a few days in the spring. Those, those low areas are areas where soils can be saturated. Um, they like to say Kernza doesn't like its feet wet. So avoid those areas. Sandy soils are, are okay. Well-drained soils are fine. It's Kernza is relatively drought tolerant. Um, and when we say that, we, we mean that Kernza can survive droughts really well. It's not going to wilt up and die. Um, but it does, uh, drought does impact grain yields. So grain yields will decline in under drought conditions, but the plant will persist. It will survive these pretty extreme drought conditions. 
Uh, heavy soils are okay too, as long as that there's not that standing water from time to time. Um, areas with lots of high pea content, uh, like phosphorus remediation, if you'd want to think of this crop as something like that, um, that works out okay too. It, it takes up a reasonable amount of phosphorus. And, um, we might talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, next reasonable question is, what variety should I use? Well, in this region, we've shown that Minnesota clear water works pretty well in this northern region compared to the other major option, and that's uh, germplasm or varieties that's coming from the Land Institute's breeding program. So if you want to get your hands on Minnesota clear water, which is the University of Minnesota publicly available variety, um, which is now coming, it's a little bit outdated. There's new lines, new varieties that are going to be made available very soon. You probably heard about that last week. But if you want to get Minnesota Clear Water, Albert Lee and Min MNL are uh, licensed dealers. Uh, and this just is a, a lot of data on a figure. But if you just look at the pink bars, Minnesota Clear Water, this is yield at different sites in Minnesota really sandy soils to some pretty heavier, high organic matter soils. Um, and the varieties, yield is on the y-axis, varieties are, are ordered from the lowest to the highest going to the right. So we see that Minnesota Clearwater did indeed yield the highest at most sites. Not all sites, but most sites. Uh, and this is some of the data that we actually use to figure out which um, population to release as a variety. So the, I mentioned the other options that are available. Those are uh, coming out of the breeding program at the Land Institute. Generally, those have been selected for hotter, drier conditions, generally. So um, they might be more suitable to other growing regions that are closer to Kansas, those of Kansas. There are a couple other breeding programs going on around the world, Sweden, Russia, Manitoba, Utah, um, including some publicly available uh, varieties, and what, at least one in Russia. So uh, if you're planning to grow this internationally, you have some options. Uh, seeding dates. So that's also the probably the next most important question, when to sow seeds. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about this. Um, first thing we need to remember is that Kurdzer requires vernalization. So that is a prolonged period of cold temperatures um, sometimes often uh, in combination with day length ranges, but cold temperatures um, to induce the seed head, to, to make a seed head. The plant doesn't experience those cold temperatures and won't produce a seed head. And that's why spring seeding is challenging because you don't get a grain yield that first year. Um, but what we need to remember too is that the plants need to be a certain size to respond to those cold temperatures. And we're going to call these vernalization units. It needs to be, we don't know exactly how big yet, but generally we've noticed that once the plants have about three leaves, they can respond to those vernalization units. Um, so that means we need to get them in the ground early enough to grow to a certain point to respond to those cold temperatures. Hey, Jake, um, uh, and we just, yes. just really quick, there's a, a couple questions that came through and it, it's kind of in line Here. with what you're just, uh, talking about there. So what at what stage okay. is the plant determining uh, tillers like reproductive tillers? Is that at the fall fall stage or spring or? So this is the second question in the chat. When in life cycles are tillers determined? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, we don't know exactly yet. Um, we think that in the fall, and it might vary for, based on year one versus year uh, subsequent years, um, we do think that tiller induction does occur in the fall. There's some evidence pointing to that, um, and which is, uh, there's a good paper by Priscilla Pinto. She might even be on this call. She wants to talk about that. But um, yeah, they, they altered the residue in the fall in different ways, which I actually changed grain yields the next year, which is a really good indication that that is occurring in the fall. Um, but uh, the exact information on that isn't just known just yet. Gotcha. Yeah. And then those yields you were displaying, that's in just, you know, hold or uh, haul on grain out of the field, not de hold ready for sale kerns of grain. 
Yeah, so I'll just make a broad general statement about the yield values that I show today. These are from research plots, unless otherwise stated. Um, and these research plots, we, we harvest them, take all the seed heads by hand in a certain area, and we do our best to, to collect every kernel that is in that area so that we know what the actual maximum potential grain yield is. Take that back to a lab, thresh those seed heads, clean them, uh, and it is naked grain per unit area. And, and I'm, I think I've converted most things to pounds per acres for this. So it's, it's like your theoretical maximum. We know that combines aren't as efficient as humans with the rice knife and cutting off the seed heads and going through all that lab process to clean the seed. But um, yep, that's what's potentially there. Great, thank you. All right. So going back to date of seeding, um, we know that earlier we plant, uh, we're giving the plants then more growing degree days to put on biomass. We want them to grow large enough so that they can make it through the winter and then take off in the spring um, and start to grow quickly to compete with the weeds that are probably also there. Um, so we know that kerns are intermediate wheatgrass. Uh, it can uh, respond to temperatures and, and use growing degree days um, as low as in the uh, low 30s. And then it kind of maxes out in those, we think, upper 80s, 90s. So anything around here is when we'll accumulate growing degree days. Um, now, I, I mentioned those vernalization units. There is a range of temperature uh, that the, the plant will experience that triggers that seed head induction. And it's a window. If it's too cold, it's not, it's not going to trigger induction. If it's too warm, it won't get induced. So it's this uh, window of temperatures. And about 40 degrees Fahrenheit is uh, kind of the center of that. Also a very hard thing to measure. Uh, so we know that if we plant earlier, we're going to have a whole lot of growing degree days. If we think of this as just the size of this arrow relative to the timing, uh, we're going to have a lot of growing degree days available to the plant if we go early. But as we delay that, there's fewer and fewer growing degree days available for the kerns of seedlings. Uh, and then we also know that if we you know, plant too early, we're not getting any fertilization units. Those are going to come at a time some, somewhere you know, around late September, maybe mid-October, depending on the location, depending on the year. Um, they're gonna, there's gonna be a certain amount of time where there's a lot of those units available, but then it gets too cold. We go into deep winter and it's, we're outside that window. Uh, it is possible to pick up vernalization units in the spring. So um, they're there, but we, we also know that there's this photo period element too that the plants are responding to, which complicates things. Um, so this is what we're looking for, making sure that they got Plenty of growing degree days, uh, but also fertilization units through grain. So we did the seeding day trial at a whole bunch of sites across North America. I'm going to focus on the ones in uh, this region, Minnesota, three site years. Um, generally, the patterns were the same. The earlier you plant, the more grain uh, could be harvested the following year. So down here on the X, it's the number of days after August 15th. So here is essentially planting on August 15th. Uh, let me get my laser pointer here. This is uh, yields that were achieved when planted on August 15th. And every day afterward, we see a very consistent decrease. The later you plant, the lower your yields will be. Uh, and this is data. Here are the actual raw values if you want to see those from our different site years. Um, planting in November produced and this and later really no grain. So uh, that was just too late. We did get a little bit, a few seed heads here, uh, but generally very poor yields. A lot of people ask about planting in mid-October, um, potentially after corn or soybean harvest. And uh, it's possible some years to get reasonable years yields, but in some years it's like here, one out of three essentially, you know, it didn't work. Uh, how deep? That's another question. Uh, 
We did a study at a greenhouse. Thomas Donnellan did this as an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota. Um, very clear patterns in terms of the percent emergence um, in response to seeding depth at three quarters of an inch was kind of the sweet spot. And there was some, um, if you go quarter inch greater than that or, or shallower, it's statistically the same. So a half inch to an inch is statistically a similar emergence. Uh, so that's what you want to shoot for, that kind of three quarter of an inch uh, depth. And this was consistent across soil types. We did this experiment with three different soil types uh, from Minnesota and the results were the same. Um, now moving into the approach, um, the question is till or no till. Uh, if you're going to prepare a seed bed, uh, there's a lot of different tools and approaches out there. Something that works, generally what you want to do is, is end up with a seed bed that's not too fluffy, um, worked well, but not too fluffy. So multiple passes with field cultivator can kind of smooth that out and make it look nice. Um, and then using a conventional grain drill, the big thing is just avoid drilling too deep. It's easy to, to sow seeds too deep with a conventional grain drill, um, some of the older ones. And then just kind of be aware of the variability in the field and your tire tracks and things like that. So this is a grain drill that we've used at the Rosemount Research and Outreach Center. Uh, we've probably planted five or six fields with this. And um, in this situation, this was two years ago, um, the, it's set up with six inch row spacing and we taped up two out of every three of the meters in the box so that we could achieve an 18 inch row spacing. Um, and I'll show you photos of fields where we did that with this exact drill. So you'll kind of see how it all worked out. Um, No-till is also a great option. The big thing there, um, Naturally, you want to make sure you do get deep enough to get into moisture, especially if there's still some uh, plants living. That's the other thing is make sure you get good thorough termination of the existing stand. That's where I've seen no-till fail the most. Um, it's trying to no-till into uh, pastures and things like that. Make sure that it's completely terminated. Uh, there's going to be, especially if there's any chance of drought or moisture stress, um, don't want those past plants using up all the water. Um, folks have experience with a lot of different models, makes and models of no-till drills. You'll just see a few different pictures here. We have a uh, Great Plains and a Truax that we've used. And a lot of these experiences have been um, collected, well, I should say, most of these came from my own experiences with a lot of different drills. I, I think there are a lot more out there that just haven't been consolidated yet. And they're in this guide. This is a few years old now, as you can see. So it'd be really great to get people's input on this. But essentially, it's just a bunch of notes um, on what the various um, aspects of the drill, how they were adjusted to achieve a specific seeding rate. And um, yeah, there's lots of notes in there. Some of these have different lock levers and you know different gearing ratios you can set up and all those are in this document. And the URL is there. There's also a QR code. So give you a few seconds here to pull your phone out and take a picture of that. Hopefully that works. Um, and there will be multiple QR codes being presented here that send you to resources. Uh, seeding rates. So, you know, we talked about, you got to calibrate that drill. Um, this has changed a little bit over the years and things are changing with the seeding rate recommendations for a number of reasons. Uh, seed size is changing, which, you know, seeds getting larger, it, what it means then is that that's one of the ultimate goals of the plant breeding program. If the seed size increases, if we don't, that means there's fewer seeds per pound. Right, so, so we need to increase the seeding rates as seed size is increased to, to keep planting the same number of seeds and getting the same number of plants. Um, so we've heard you know, 12 up to 15 pounds per acre, um, 15 pounds of live seed. So adjusting for germination rate 
per acre on a six, six inch row is uh, just a scenario we can start to discuss here and think about what that means in terms of a population. Uh, so if you did that, went ahead and, and planted 15 pounds of live seed on a six inch row spacing, um, and then uh, your neighbor was going to plant on a 12 inch row spacing, uh, she would probably have to half that seeding rate to achieve the exact same plant population, right? The same number of plants per row. So we have to remember that uh, seeding rate isn't just one universal thing. It's really going to be dependent on row spacing. Uh, so if we think about a scenario, yeah, we need to calibrate our drills. We need to make sure that we're putting enough seed um, in the field per row. And there's a made a calculator for this. And if there's some time, maybe we can open it up. But here's a scenario. Let's say our goal is to achieve 16 pounds of pure live seed per acre on a six inch row spacing. Uh, and if you calculate that out, we know what the seed, the weight of the seed is, every single kernel, what the average weight is. Um, it means that we would end up with 10 seeds per foot. And that is a good target population to go to 10 seeds per foot. Um, and to get there with our current germplasm, um, if you want to know if you're at that 10 seeds per foot, you can either run your drill for 100 feet or you know, not even that far, just run your drill and get down and try to count the seeds, but that can be pretty difficult. So one good approach is to put a plastic baggie at a, um, and rubber band it to the end of some of your openers and then run the drill a certain distance, a known distance, and then we can weigh those seeds. And uh, if you're at that 10 to 18 grams per 100 feet, you're in the ballpark. It's kind of hard to get it perfectly, but that's in the ballpark. And again, that's going to depend on how much, how clean your seed is, how much chaff is in there, if you have the latest gen genetics and they're larger seeds. Um, but I would write that down as a target. Um, 10 to 18 grams per 100 feet per row. So each of those bags would have to be 10 to 18 grams. And I, like I said, I have a calculator here that we can spreadsheet. You just plug in your row spacing, your target seating rate, and it'll give you information if you want to vary that. Um, you know, keep checking your box. Bridging has been an issue for some seeders. I haven't had a whole lot of issues with it. Um, I think that's those issues are getting resolved as uh, we get cleaner and cleaner seed. Row spacing, so that, yeah, what what should we target? Six versus twelve inch rows, or even higher? Um, this we did a study in northern Minnesota over a number of years, three years. So the red line just shows what yields were. Uh, this one I didn't convert to pounds per acre, but it's very close. Um, in 6, 12, 18, 24, and 36 inch rows. And we saw a very clear trend, narrower rows produced higher yields in that first year. Uh, there's more plants per uh, unit area. It makes a lot of sense that you get higher yields, but that trend disappeared after the second and third year. And in this case, we did see one of those uh, situation with a substantial yield decline with stand age. Um, and row spacing did not, did not uh, mitigate that. Uh, so other better things to consider when choosing a row spacing, uh, weed suppression is a big one. Narrower rows will also suppress weeds, um, especially in an organic system. And if you don't have the equipment to cultivate in between rows, uh, narrow rows is, is a good, good approach. Um, I do want to mention a couple other things about the wider row spacing, though. Uh, there have been observations of higher yields in wider row spacings. Um, they have, there's um, a study that was conducted in North Dakota on intermediate wheatgrass seed production that really highlighted that. They're, they found that the wider the row spacing, actually the higher their yields were. Um, very different conditions in terms of precipitation and, and soil fertility, but more work definitely needs to be done to evaluate row spacing impacts. Uh, so we plant our fields, get them going, and you know, 10 to 15 days, turns the seeds 
usually seedlings start to emerge depending on how early you plant. And then the question is, was that uh, seeding a success? And I'll talk about some of the metrics that one can use to assess success. Um, this is a photo of Kernza, the, just in the middle here. Um, these are some field plots, research plots that were planted. Um, there, the photo was taken on October 10th. So this is 25 days after planting. And we planted on September 15th. And cereal rye was planted around the border. And that was actually planted a few days after the Kernza. So um, you can see that cereal rye, as I mentioned earlier, it's an annual species. It, it grows faster. It's more vigorous than the perennial. The perennial has to invest some of that, those growing degree days and energy into root production. Um, that's part of the life cycle of the, of the perennial. So uh, it requires energy to build roots, and that could be coming at the expense of the ability to produce a lot of leaves quickly uh, during establishment. Um, so you can see clearly the difference in uh, the growth potential. Uh, here's a field that was planted um, on 12 inch rows on September 2nd. This was the day that we planted. Uh, this whole field was in oats prior to this. And here is the a photo taken on the 21st of that same month, September. So 19 days after seed seeding. And all of that, most of that green stuff you see out there is oats. So here's another situation where we had a lot of um, challenges with volunteers and it was quite scary. This is a, a major, this is our currency cap trial. So very major investment. Uh, and we went out and measured, uh, took uh, rulers and placed them in the rows where we planted the Kernza and, and found out what plants were Kernza, which ones were oats. And um, on average, after measuring all the plants, we had five plants per foot. And we used that same target seeding rate to get 10 live seeds per foot. So half of them had turned into plants. Uh, and we did not, we went forward with this planting. We didn't terminate it. We crossed our fingers and hoped that the um, oats would winter kill, which they did. And it actually turned out beautifully and I'll show some photos of it. But if you wanna look at your seedlings, how to identify them, often they have a little bit of purple here towards the base. Um, and you can clearly see when they're still attached uh, to the endosperm, you can easily identify the seedlings. Uh, well, one trick is just that sort of purple color towards the base. Uh, here is that field. This is the kerns in the foreground. This is a different plot of, of corn and, and weeds. Um, but that those five plants per foot turned into quite a robust stand. And I'm going to show you more photos of that. So here's a field. Uh, this is um, a photo taken on May 11th of 2019. The field was planted with Kernza in September using that grain drill that I showed you a photo of earlier on 18 inch row spacing. So that's what those spacing is here. Um, and we ended up at planting at seven pounds per acre. So 18 inch rows, seven pounds per acre. And you can see what the stand looks like from here. Um, it's, there's some skips. It's not beautiful. It looks, you know, kind of worrisome. There's some low spots that look pretty sad. Um, this field yielded over 400 pounds per acre the first year. And here's what it looks like in the second year. I wish I had a photo of all of the, the seed heads in that first year. I, I don't, but I have a few others. So here's what it looks like in the second year. You clearly see how that stand is thickening up. Um, we're already starting to see some recruitment in between the rows. Uh, here it is in May of that second year, uh, continues to tiller. And um, we had quite good yields too in the second year. I think we're still in that four to 500 pounds per acre. Um, that's a photo of it in July 24th for harvest. Here's the fall of that second year. Now we can see that there is quite a bit of recruitment in between rows. You can barely tell that there were rows there. Uh, and here it is in June, approaching the third year. And we saw quite a substantial decline in grain yields in this field. 
and it seemed to be associated with that filling in of the stand. It became quite dense. Um, yeah, so that I think is all the topics that I listed for establishment. I'm happy to open up the chat box here and take some questions for those that haven't been answered already. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, awesome, Jake. Somebody asked for the, the link to the calculator that you were referencing. Would you mind dropping that in the chat? Yeah, I can definitely do that. Um, what I will do, so I don't have to shut down my presentation and open up a website, um, at the end of the, the talk, I'll, I'll drop in the chat um, as Perfect. we're kind of shutting down, as you say, closing words. Are there any other questions in here? It looks like there are a bunch that were addressed. Is there anything that we should tackle? Yeah, one one was a uh, uh, question that just came in here. Was the filling in due to just the plant growing or was it more because of the volunteer seed uh, from when the fields were cleared? Great question. Um, combination of both. And um, so, so we are seeing recruitment in between rows uh, from shattered seed. And uh, there was a time when we weren't sure if those sat shattered seedlings were actually going to make it throughout the year and, and turn into full on plants. And we did some research on that. And indeed, they are. So they are contributing to the filling in. Um, the other reason that they're filling in is these crowns get a little bit wider and wider each year. They, they, the tillers, the, the crowns expand and they are rhizomatous. So they, they produce some rhizomes. So they kind of creep in between the row. Um, the right, so the rhizomes are also contributing to the filling in. Um, we looked at some methods to prevent that filling in. Uh, we've used inter-row cultivation. Uh, we've band sprayed herbicides with hoods right down the middle of the rows. Um, and we've learned so far that we haven't found an approach to doing that that consistently works. So I wouldn't recommend, if you want to experiment with some things, uh, it really can't hurt. Um, it's just your the time and cost you put into doing it. But um, I, I can't say that this is definitely going to work. It's going to pr prevent yields from declining in stand age. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that within the next few years, the research that we're doing. So, so Jake, uh, earlier you showed that slide where there was a strong dependency on uh, row spacing the first year, and then yes. with uh, flat multiple years. But, but that showed the opposite, right? The narrow row spacing gave the highest yields. That's correct. That's what we mm -hmm. found in in Rozo. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. So I, yeah, year one. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Uh, any other questions about establishment? And if they come to you later, we can cover them at the end. Um, I want to highlight a few new resources and opportunities um, available. These are federal incentives and financial support. So some of this information is hot off the press um, coming from Cindy Bartel's work on the currency cap and Aaron Meyer from Greenlands Blue Waters uh, have been leading this effort. And uh, Kernza is now uh, eligible for um, EQIP program. So EQIP 328 conservation crop rotation. Um, payments can be made to producers in Minnesota and Michigan. So um, applications are accepted throughout the year. Uh, establishment year counts as the first year, even if it's seeded in the fall, because there's an environmental benefit being accrued that first year. Uh, the stand must be in production for three years, which includes that first year. So if you've seen the uh, 2000, you know, 2024 in the fall, uh, payments can be made in 2024, then 2025 and 2026, harvested for grain, it's still in the system. Um, and then you could rotate out that point if that's you know what's right for your system. And up to payments are, uh, can be made up for up to five years. And this program, 75% of the costs are covered. Previously planted kerns of fields are not eligible. That's the big kicker. CSP is similar. Um, and I'm not an expert on these programs. 
but uh, but what I, how I understand it, CSP is a, is a whole farm program, which is why it's a little bit different from EQIP. Um, I'm not sure. I think applications are still accepted throughout the year. Same, same. 100% of the costs are covered in CSP. So there's a great overview document that Cindy put together for these two programs. Um, you can click, the, or the link is going to be available. These slides will be available, so you'll have all the links, including the one to the calculator afterwards, uh, or use this QR code. Uh, we have an example payment schedule for both states, Minnesota and Michigan, so you can see what the costs, uh, the estimated costs that were generated by NRCS come to for those states to get an idea of what the payment would be. And then a step-by-step -step guide to enrollment, probably um, one of the most valuable documents if you're considering doing this. And I'm sure Cindy would be happy to take questions if you have any. Um, so any questions on that? Otherwise, I'm gonna start talking about fertility. Let's see. Cindy's online, which is awesome. So if folks have questions, um, feel free to direct them to her. Thank you. All right, with um, what we have remaining, I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for Q&A on this co uh, content as well. Uh, so we'll talk mostly about nitrogen, fertility, and Kernza. You've probably seen a lot of these numbers before. If we, if we think about an annual crop, uh, we can, uh, it's, it's, it's a heck of a lot easier thinking about managing nitrogen for an annual crop than a perennial crop. A perennial crop is moving nitrogen to different plant parts, including roots. It's really hard to measure how much root biomass is there, how much nitrogen is in that root biomass. Uh, the ability of that root, very extensive root system to scavenge existing nitrogen from the soil, uh, which you know really changes how much a farmer needs to put on. Uh, so quite a bit different, but this is a classic sort of uh, curve that we see for nitrogen accumulation in a corn field, in a corn plant. Um, so through time here in the different corn stages, we get to about 200 to 250 pounds of nitrogen uh, per acre in a corn field. So we, and this is another very famous figure showing where that nitrogen is in terms of the crop tissue. Uh, starts off in the stalk and the leaves. Uh, and then once it hits the reproductive stage, some of that nitrogen goes into the tassels, cobs, and then finally grain. And we see by the end of uh, physiological maturity, half the nitrogen or more is in the grain compared to the other tissues. So there's this reallocation of nitrogen through the plant. And we need to figure all this out for Kernza as well to really properly manage the nitrogen budget. So here are some numbers of those kind of similar uh, aspects of the nitrogen budget for Kernza. So we, we have a, an additional though, uh, additional crop tissue to consider. So we'll look at grain, straw, roots, and then the total. And the first column is the, the amount of tissue in the field in terms of pounds per acre. Uh, then we've also been able to figure out roughly how much nitrogen is in that tissue. Um, and then we can calculate the actual uh, total amount of nitrogen in that tissue per acre. So let's just say we have a system where we're producing 450 pounds of grain. 3.4% uh, of that is nitrogen. And that means we have about 15 pounds of nitrogen in kerns of grain alone in the field. Uh, straw yield might be 4,000 pounds, two tons. Uh, and we're a much lower nitrogen content there, 1.1%. But that means we still have about 45 pounds of nitrogen just tied up in the straw. Roots down to... 40 centimeters or so can easily reach 4,000, another two tons uh, of biomass at 1%, a little bit less nitrogen. We have another 40 pounds of nitrogen in the roots. So we look at this, sum it all up, and we're, we can uh, assume that a Kerns of field will have a, will need about 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre just to sustain those tissues. Uh, now, it does get confusing because there's some recycling of nitrogen going on and things like that. 
But if we step back and, and look at the data that has been generated so far about grain yield responses to nitrogen fertilizer rates, when we just look at grain yield responses, uh, years and years of data have suggested that yields are maximized. Grain yield is maximized between that 60 and 80 pounds of nitrogen per acre. But that's less than what's in the plant. So we have to really pay attention to how much is being removed. Um, and then, you know, is this a sustainable practice of applying less nitrogen that the, than the crop actually needs each year? Um, Kernza has a deep root system. They can also access nitrogen that is in the soil in, in various steps. Uh, so it's, it's a complicated budget, but this is kind of where we're heading. So um, we've seen these, these are grain yield responses to nitrogen fertilizer rates, and we see a, a drastic decline uh, over and over again in grain yields at the high end rates, even rates that are just slightly higher than what we think the plant needs. Um, and that's really because of lodging. And I don't think my photo turned out here, but I have a picture of lodged kerns and I'm sure you've all seen lodged grain crops before. Uh, lodging is still an issue. Um, some years it's worse than others. The 2023, we did experience lodging. We had conditions here in uh, eastern or central Minnesota where we did have some lodging. So it's still a problem. Uh, plant breeders are working on breeding shorter plants. They've achieved that. The plants are substantially shorter with the new germplasm, um, but still something to be concerned about. Uh, the other thing that we need to remember, too, is other pathways for loss. So nitrate leaching to the groundwater. Uh, that has been well studied in Kernza, and there is very little, if any, nitrate leaching happening because of that deep, dense root system. Kernza is really effective at taking up anything that's applied. So we don't have to worry too much about that leaching pathway. But there's another one that's less studied, and that's denitrification or ammonification. Uh, the volatilization of nitrogen to the atmosphere. <laughs> By no means am I going to explain this, but this is a very complicated figure that shows uh, all the different aspects of this nitrogen uh, cycle and the processes taking place and to, to lead to these pathways that I'm just circling here, these volatilization pathways and denitrification. So there's a lot happening and it's dependent on a lot of things. Um, so we'll zoom back out and say, you know, our recommendations so far have been based on broadcast applying urea, top dressing, if you will, in the spring. That's where we've just held that, those things constant um, to figure out what's the best rate. And now our research is expanding to looking at different timings of application um, and eventually also different forms of nitrogen. Uh, so a reasonable amount of research has been done in organic systems, looking at different types of manure. And, and that's a whole, adds a whole other level of complexity to things. Um, but if we just, you know, pause and say, all right, spring application, um, to avoid those volatilization losses, um, avoid applying urea on cool, dry soil. This should say, uh, this is a little bit of a, typo, we should um, make sure to apply prior to a precipitation event. So do apply in cool, dry soils earlier in the spring, preferably when they're not damp. Uh, and then prior to a precipitation event, I'll make sure that's fixed before this is uh, sent out. And then fall application uh, is turning into an option. So we have to do some research on that, to figure out you know, it, it are the losses different from a fall application compared to a spring. And what does that mean for grain yield? Um, so this is some research, some results from an experiment that is similar to the past experiments, looking at nitrogen rate or grain yield responses to nitrogen rates, um, to nitrogen applied as urea. And these are all spring applied rates. So follows a very similar pattern as we've seen in the past, maximizing, at 80 pounds per acre in the spring, tails off at higher rates, um, substantially larger than a control. Uh, in this exact same study, we also did some split applications. 
So we also started looking at applying some of the nitrogen in the spring, uh, half of it, and then the other half later on. So more uh, at stem elongation. So when I say spring, I mean green up or perhaps March. Um, and then the, the split, the summer split would be in mid-May, late May. Uh, no benefit to that, and actually maybe even a little bit of a reduction in yield. So uh, then we also looked at applying those same rates in the fall only. So in this situation, in these site years, which is a limited data set, three site years in Minnesota, uh, we saw a significant increase in, in grain yields in response to the fertilizer applied in the fall. So fall did appear to help. And then we looked at the fall spring or split, um, and it didn't really provide too much of a benefit. Uh, so fall sort of won out in this situation. But that was just one study of, I think I said, three site years. And we're doing some of this work as part of a larger Kearns Cap project. Uh, and that you know, project has six sites across the US, from Ohio, Kansas, Nebraska, two in Wisconsin, uh, one in Minnesota. And here are some results from the first year in just Minnesota. So I'm just zooming in on the Minnesota site here. And um, this is all spring applied. We have 40 pounds in the spring, zero, 40 in the spring, 40 in the spring plus the split. So another 40 in the fall and then 80 in the spring. And this time the, the split didn't really do anything. Uh, and actually where we started to see a, a substantial increase in grain yields was those higher end rates up to the 120. Uh, which is what we think is closer to what the Kernza needs. And in that situation, we did not have conditions that resulted in lodging. So we think that because we were able to avoid the lodging, we could get more nitrogen on and get higher yields. Um, and this is uh, some, so the next big question is, does Kernza require the same amount of nitrogen year after year, or should that recommendation be changing with stand age? And there's growing evidence that the Kernza stand is becoming more dependent on nitrogen as the stands age. And this is a complicated graph, but it, it's uh, from a big meta-analysis. Um, Roberta, who's part of Kernza Cap, and Andrew Bash in Nebraska looked at a whole bunch of research from the uh, United States and, and maybe even beyond. And what this shows is as this dot moves to the right, it means that the Kernza had a greater grain yield response to nitrogen um, year one, two, three, four. So by year four, we saw you know, a very consistent, strong response to end fertilizer. There's a lot of discussion about using uh, alpha, um, legume intercrops to provide some biologically fixed nitrogen to the Kernza. Uh, this is a great idea and we're making progress, but again, it's kind of hard to recommend one specific legume species that's going to fit all these different growing situations in Minnesota and beyond. Um, this is alfalfa intercropped with Kernza. Uh, so you can imagine that we can alter the population of both species. That's going to change the outcome. We can alter the planting configuration. This one has a row of Kernza alfalfa, Kernza alfalfa, one after another. We've changed that in many different ways. You know, pairs of rows of Kernza with one of the legume on the outside, lots of different configurations. Uh, and then of course, we've tested a lot of different legume species. All these different legume species have different traits that change the way that they can make that nitrogen available to the Kernza. Um, and that's really what we want. We want that, that nitrogen to be transferred to the grain crop. Uh, I won't go into these to make sure that we have time for questions, but this is results from uh, a study where we had Kernza grain yield again on the y-axis. And then uh, we have yields from a control plot with 45 pounds of nitrogen and then with 90 pounds of nitrogen as urea. And then these are yields when intercropped with different species. So alcyc clover, bird's foot trefoil, alfalfa, Canada milk vetch, red clover, uh, and white clover. And you can see that there's a lot of variability um, in the grain yields, and that's in the first year. The second year, things kind of evened out a little bit. And 
oddly enough, in this study, the third year is when we saw the highest grain yields. Um, but we, you know, there's no consistency here. We can't say tell you that alfalfa is always going to be, you know, the best legume for intercropping. That's we're just not there yet. Um, a lot of factors that influence that outcome. All right, so that was probably a whirlwind of information. I want to highlight that there's a lot of a lot of resources at our lab's website, sustainablecropping.umn.edu. There's a tab of resources, and there's a whole bunch of uh, videos of talks and uh, field days and things like that. There's a whole bunch of documents how to get started growing Kernza. I just posted the new documents that Cindy made for the uh, EQIP and CSP programs. They're on there. You'll find all that there. This uh, QR code should take you to that website. Um, and then you can talk, contact any of us uh, to, for more information on those. And all of this work has been done by um, tons and tons of collaborators. These are postdocs, technicians, and graduate students who've contributed to this work in the Sustainable Cropping Systems Lab. Uh, I also want to acknowledge all the funding agencies, um, Minnesota Department of Agriculture, Clean Water Council, Forever Green Initiative um, have really supported a lot of this agronomic work. The USDA NEFA Kernza cap. Uh, so keep those entities in mind when you're thinking about how to support this research. Uh, it's definitely underfunded and under researched compared to our, most of our annual crops. And uh, we could you know, it, it really benefit from growing our community. All right, I think I could have some time to take some questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Jake. Uh, I think I speak for everybody here. We're, it's a lot of really great information um, and I definitely learned a lot, uh, not only about seeding, but kind of all aspects of, of management. And there was some great conversations kind of sidebar in the chat. I think, I don't think there's anything um quite outstanding uh to answer but yeah open up the floor to questions uh, if you have them type them in the chat or come off mute and ask your question while jake's here and if it wasn't clear before too um we will share all these resources with uh folks on the email list um and share copies of the presentations as well. Uh, I, I'm intrigued by this, uh, uh, how tillering uh, interacts with yield. And this is uh, largely uh, Matt Levitt's fault. Um, so you planted, uh, you, you had that slide uh, early on, Jake, that showed that very strong uh, correlation between yield and planting date. Yes. And so I'm wondering if you plant early, are you perhaps uh, getting tillers in the fall that, that first year? Yeah, or... there, there, tillering does occur in that first year after planting, um, but not nearly as extensively as it does that first spring. So in the first year, you can usually go out into your field and identify your individual plants. And those individual plants may, might start to tiller and have multiple tillers, but it, there's still, there's definition there, you can tell. But by May, I'd say, but you know, in April is when they go crazy and tiller. And by May, you can barely even tell what's an individual plant. Um, that's when I think most of the tillings occur. Yeah. And then uh, we were, we were having a, a email discussion and uh, uh, Matt speculated that if tillering did occur in the fall, uh, then the weather conditions during the fall would have an impact, you know, on the tillering and then, you know, possibly in the uh, subsequent year. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's and, and then, question for there. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh and then just kind of like uh, going on this theme here, you had your uh fall nitrogen application, right? Mm -hmm. And showed very strong response. And I'm just wondering when in the fall that application was made. <laughs> was that made That's... earlier in the fall? And uh then is that stimulating the plant <clears throat> to uh tiller more or to is, is, is it possible that tillers maybe like uh, get 
formed at an embryonic level in the fall, but then they get expressed in the spring? Yep, it, it is. Uh, so we applied nitrogen in the fall in early to mid-October. And pretty convinced that the timing of that fall application is also quite important about how that yield is going to respond the next year to the fall application. Um, some colleagues out east have been applying nitrogen fertilizer a couple weeks after grain harvest. So we're talking like September mm. and um, have good success with that. I think that that's really important. And, that, and for that very reason that you're giving the plants a shot of nitrogen at this time when they're stressed, you just clean out all the biomass um, and they're, they're using you know, the reallocating nitrogen from stored in crowns. And, and so, yeah, that could be beneficial to give it the nitrogen earlier, probably more beneficial than waiting till something like November. Um, yeah, and then we also got to think about like where, what are the risks of those losses as the season changes in the fall? Um, and the state of Minnesota is, you know, really conscientious about making sure that we're avoiding nitrogen losses if fall applied nitrogen on different crops. So. Yeah, good, good stuff. Uh, lot, lots of uh, lots of opportunities for research here. <laughs> Job security. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Isn't that the end of every good research paper? More research is needed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had a couple of questions. One, uh, the simple one, or is uh, I practice no-till as my um, tillage practice. And we typically, when planting alfalfa, uh, often roll with a land roller to firm up the seed bed, lower rocks, that sort of thing. Is that sort of thing encouraged? That's a simple one. The other one, I was surprised the way you described uh, target populations in terms of live plants per linear foot in a row, as opposed to live plants per uh, unit of area, uh, square foot or acre or whatever. And I, yeah, so that's different than how I've thought about most other crops that I've ever planted. It's live plants per unit of area. And if you could explain why uh, Kernza does not seem to, why you're not targeting live plants per area versus linear foot. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the question about like rolling like a cultipacker or something like that over the field. Um, We've typically used a smooth roller. Um, okay. As much for, you know, rock and those sort of thing management as it is for firming the seed bed, either before or after using a, a no-till drill. Yeah, before or after your no-till. Um, uh, what I can say about like our experiences with that is, and this is actually in a prepared seed bed, uh, packing after planting really has a, a beneficial impact on seedling success. So we found that, yeah, improving that soil seed contact a little bit with those small seeds um, after drilling them does improve establishment. Um, but I haven't done much in terms of using uh, a packer of any sort with a no-till operation. So I'm not sure if it's actually going to be beneficial. Um, and then the question about yeah, thinking about the population in terms of plants per row rather than plants per unit area. Um, yeah, it's it, it may not be conventional compared to other crops. But I think because we're working with a lot of there's a, a lot of more variability with Kernza than some of our other crops. So um, the seed size is different. It seems like from lot to lot, so it's a pretty large variation there. The cleanliness of it. Um, so the, you know, the, the, how many seeds per pound is going to be varying depending on how dehulled it was, um, until we get some of these standards down, um, it's just, so, so what we're trying to do, and also the, the row spacing varies a lot, uh, unlike some of the other crops, um, you know, our small grains are always going to be six, seven and a half inch, most likely, and, um, uh, some of the grass seed producers, especially the intermediate wheat grass seed producers are using those really wider rows, as I mentioned. And there's a lot of people interested in exper experimenting with different rows. Um, 
So that's a factor. And then the other major factor is that the plants are kind of filling in and it's really hard to look at number of plants per unit area or per, per row after that first May. It's really just turns into like a filled in row. So these are the metrics we've, we've been able to come up with thinking about seeds per foot and then plants per foot really just in that first seedling year. And then we start to transition honestly to we think about like percent cover, what percent of the ground cover is occupied because they're filling in and, and it's, it's a messier system than just the individual plants in a row. So um, I, yeah, I think it's, it's just a, it allows us to be a little bit more explicit um, with some recommendations. Hopefully yeah, not a perfect analogy, but I know when I when we did, <clears throat> you know, corn stand counts and uh, would do agronomic field visits, we would often, you know, tape off the length of row and count count plants in the row. I mean, it's depends on you, you can't establish, um, you know, seeding rates for for crops like Carmen mentioned, you know, either by linear foot or or by you know meter squared measurements. It it does kind of boil down to you know, how um, thorough you are at investigating the field too, because sometimes, you know, you can be biased towards areas that are covered or not, or, you know, the more measurements, the better um, out in the field, for sure. This is great. Um, well, we are at uh, seven minutes over. Uh, like I said, you know, happy to keep this keep this open. I do want to be cognizant of of Jake's time too. Um, so, Jake, by all means, if you need to drop off or you know get back to what you're doing, feel free. Um, but yeah, I'll keep this open as long as people want to keep keep chatting. This is great. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, Sam. Okay, awesome. Um, so I'm a graduate student um, at Iowa State University, and I'm actually doing some research. Um, my research focus is on Kernza and specifically the milling, the milling characteristics of it. And I was wondering if you had any resources for me to purchase Kernza. Mm. Uh, I, Carmen, this is your cue. <laughs> There's there's a grower led cooperative uh, that is going to be your best bet, but yeah, definitely um, be in touch with uh, the Kearns uh, Perennial Promise Growers Co-op, and I can uh, I can put my uh, contact information in the chat and be in touch with me, and we can uh, connect you with some Kearns uh, seed for sure. Okay, awesome. That helps a lot. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, I guess we'll wrap things up here today. Again, just want to uh, say thank you to Jake for taking the time and, and putting together such an informative presentation. I really appreciate that. And thank you to all for being here. Um, uh, just as a, a heads up, our next uh, meeting is going to be in two weeks, same time in two weeks time. So it's not, it's not going to be until I believe that's uh, February 7th at one o'clock. And we're going to talk through Kernza Harvest um, with Carmen and um, Kurt and a couple other uh, present presenters there too. So um, until then, uh, we'll send around some, some emails to this crew and um, we'll see you in two weeks. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. I got your number, Carmen. Thanks. <laughs>